Our next speaker is, um, is a lawyer. He has his own um, lawyer office, and he is working with free software. Please welcome Michael, Michael Stehmann. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here on stage for the second year in a row talking about free software. When talking about digital sovereignty, my stance is that it is only possible with free software. Let me introduce myself. I'm a law professional. I studied law at the University of Cologne with um, two state exams as mandated by the German law. I worked as a lawyer for quite some time, also as a freelancer. As a law professional, I have an interest in free software, and this is why I'm a member of the legal network of uh, the free software Friends Europe, and as a freelancer, I also joined the Open Office Project. Und außerdem and habe ich mit Freunden ein Verein together with friends I also founded an association which I'm also the chairman of as I'm a law expert it's a wie sich das gehört erstmal eine Übersicht worüber ich spreche now an overview of my talk First, I'm going to talk about what is sovereignty, because we have to have a closer look at the concept. Then, I'm going to talk about free licenses. And the third question I want to look at is, why is free software needed for digital sovereignty? Digital sovereignty has become a buzzword, one has to say. Everyone's postulating it, every company, every community, every country, every association. Umbrella organizations are postulating it. So there's not a day where digital sovereignty isn't postulated. I think digital is a clear term, at least here, with our audience. But what does sovereignty mean? And this is what I want to talk about now. If you look at the definition, an old man like me would do that in the Duden. In this dictionary, it says sovereignty is the highest order of power. Okay, then the second definition is the independence of a state from the influence of other states. And the third, so uh, sovereignty being um, secure and able to navigate the world on your own. This would be a dream in terms of software. Now, synonyms are also listed in the Duden. Tochtony is listed as a synonym. Hommingberg soll digital souverän werden. Und jetzt ist die eine Hälfte der IT-Abteilung der Stadt Hommingberg. Now, um, there's a city called Hommingberg, which wanted to be digitally sovereign. And it resulted it 
it resulted in half of the city being actually uh, had a half of the city's IT department being actually sovereign, creating their own programs. And employees of the city did programming courses and now are writing their own programs. It doesn't really work like that. It would be very ambitious, even for Germany. And also for Europe, it would be a real challenge. Autonomy means that you can define on yourself on your own terms. Then sovereignty then maturity is also listed as a synonym, so that also goes into the concept of uh, being superior. It means that you have experience and skills in what you're doing. Then self-reliance and self-government, self-management, and supremacy, what does that mean? Am I superior to other people or I, am I superior to the cause? Independence and a position of power, well, this is a word you shouldn't maybe you shouldn't use in this context. So, when talking about sovereignty, you encounter Karl Schmidt sooner or later. This is a man who had some interesting views, to put it mildly, and he was also kind of um, keen of the National Socialist regime. And he said, sovereign is the person who decides or who is in power in situations, in exceptional situations. And you can say that about politicians, about leaders, about companies who run certain platforms and who now say that digital sovereignty for them means that they decide on their own what people can communicate on their platforms, who they communicate with. And this goes beyond and, and what is communicated beyond the borders of the state they reside in. This has nothing to do with free software, but this is a popular stance. And that is also because politicians in a democratic liberal system, we all remember that there's a politician who now has a high position in the EU and who thought that certain contents should also only be available at night in Germany. That was supposedly to protect children and maybe something she didn't understand is if it's night in Germany, it's day somewhere else. That's because of the rotation of the earth. Maybe someone should tell her that. This sovereignty is also called the monopoly of the last decision or the final decision. So if a state wants digital sovereignty, they are basically saying that they want to be in control of everything. That's frankly, in my opinion, it doesn't go well with my understanding of democracy and a free society.
You could also say that those are people who would like to put up walls and fences on the internet and make their own walled gardens that they cultivate, if you want to say it positively. So they want to decide what content, opinions, pictures can be shared on their networks. This is so, for example, they want to dictate that only men can show their nipples on the internet and not women. And of course, they're saying that they do this for the benefit of the users and for protection of our children and so on. So, it's kind of a condescending sovereignty. So this is also not the sovereignty that I define in terms of free software. So you see that the concept of sovereignty is diverse and there's different usages of the concept. So you always have to question what is the position of the person who uses that term and what do they want to, what is their interest in using it. Digital sovereignty doesn't have a common definition and it's also not differentiated in terms of its content. So, a lot of people are using the term for their own benefit and trying to fill it with content. You could use the terms in the context of being able to make your own decision and be sovereign on the web. This is more of an engineering definition. It's not suited for politicians. If you put independence in absolute term, this doesn't exist in the analog world either. So, of course, it also doesn't exist in the digital world. Now, trying to define this, um, you can say digital sovereignty is the sum of all abilities and options of individuals and institutions which allow them to take on their roles in the digital realm in an independent, self-determined and safe way. That sounds good, but to make it viable, there is another question. Digital sovereignty has certain prerequisites that also arise from this definition. You need competencies, skills of, for example, employees. You have to have a choice. If I don't have a choice, I'm not sovereign because then I have no other option than to take what is offered to me. And security, security or IT security is a big issue here at the CCC. And this is a good thing. Now, let's get to free software. Sovereignty, as we've elaborated, you always have to question who is saying it and why are they saying it. Now, free software, software is defined as free if, it's, if it has a license that has um, certain prerequisites or that uh, fulfills certain requirements. And this determines whether a program is free software or if it has freedom as a quality in terms of the law. So, software 
with freedom built into it. There are four basic freedoms that are called use, study, share and improve. So this means that A, you can use the program as you wish for any purpose. Second, you are free to study how the program works and to change it so it does your computing as you wish. Also, um, you're able to share copies to help others. And you're allowed to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. And to do so, you need the source code. And by doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes. And the conclusion is, a program is free software when users have all of these freedoms. Now, what is the benefit for the user? And what is the benefit of digital sovereignty to the user? Primarily, a program that is free software can be used for any cause and for any duration. So there's no limits in content or in the usage period. So if the license elapses, it's not free software. So you can use it anytime, anywhere, and for any purpose. So of course, you're able to use free software to write blackmail letters or to, for reasons that others might consider immoral. And you can also use it on as many computers and with as many processors as you want. That is also a very practical freedom because the times where people had one computer that was not connected to the internet are long over. We're living in times in a, in a digital, in digital and networked time. And also the freedom to make copies and to distribute them is very interesting because it, it saved you license management efforts. I remember visiting an event where license auditing was mentioned and people were angry that programs or companies took the right to look into the source code or the license of a software to see whether it's really available without limits. Now, this freedom also allows people to practice their skills which they may be able to use professionally. So free software also allows employees, for example, to gain competencies, gain new skills. Schools, companies and authorities can recommend installing free software to teachers or employees without limits. This allows a sovereign use. And by sovereign, I mean informed and independent. So users can use the software in this definition of sovereign. 
uh, blieben Anwender auch vom Wohlwollen des Anbieters abhängig. Das heißt, ich, And if that freedom uh, didn't, didn't das, exist, uh, people um, would be at the mercy soll, of the doch of nicht so the distributor of the software. Zu viele Funktionen hat oder zu wenig Funktionen, um, uh, dann müsste ich bei muss ich bei proprietärer Software And immer dem proprietary Hersteller software has sagen, the disadvantage uh, that you always have to tell the provider, um, please give me this and that feature. And if they say, no, we won't do that, or we, uh, we will only do that if you pay us money, that's a restriction of the sovereignty of the user of the software. So free software can always be adjusted to your individual or your company's needs. Also, free software doesn't have a vendor lock-in. This means that I can choose my own partners for development, installation, support, changes, training, etc. Usually, you have many companies to choose and pick from, also small and medium-sized enterprises that you can work with locally. Also, you have security of planning because the license is doesn't have a limit. So, I don't have to fear raised license fees or fees for an update or upgrade, which gives me the ability to plan. But also, if the provider of the software doesn't provide any updates anymore or goes bankrupt even, I still can use the software. I can develop it further on my own and also join other users in developing it further. Or you're looking for someone else who can take on the development because that's possible with free software. This is not possible with proprietary software. And yeah. At the same time, do we have a freedom simply due to diversity? Because there are forks. I can choose which fork do I take. Do I take LibreOffice? Do I take OpenOffice? There are different softwares. Um, for the same purpose, or even same as different versions of the same software. So there are different forks and developments, and freedom gives rise to creativity, and therefore we have a choice among several options. And another benefit is that we don't have to get a special license just to try the software. We can just install it and use it. So there are no investments into the licenses. But unfortunately, there's not diversity for every use case especially with software that is highly specific for a certain area of the economy, um, or different area of the industry, there might not be that many programs to choose from. For example, it's a lot harder to get different software as, as a lawyer. And also for architects, it might not be the easiest uh, way to find software. And security is another important topic. 
especially in context with digital sovereignty. So with proprietary software, it is uh, impossible for the user to determine if the software has the required quality and security of the software that they are using. But if you have access to the source code, then you don't have that problem. You can investigate. Of course, uh, you also have to take into account that you might not, that the compilation unit, so the compiled program, is actually not derived from the source code that you have access to. This is something you have to take into account. And another problem is, in this context, is security by obscurity, because you're losing safety, uh, security, because it's not possible that the software is verified by third, party, third parties. And fortunately, we have transparency with free software. And there's often a documentation of the algorithms. And the functionality and the implementation of the software is much more transparent compared to proprietary software. But in, but of course, there are also examples in practice where not enough investigations have been made, and uh, that's why there are now uh, financial support programs um, to sponsor open source maintainers to find um, security holes and to find security issues in open source software. I will talk about that a bit later when, when we talk about how to improve the situation. What can we, uh, what can we um, ask for instead of digital sovereignty? So, so with free software, we have the digital source code, we can study it. And if there are many uh, reviewers of the source code, then security issues are typically quickly discovered and fixed in a short time. So this is the rule, but unfortunately there are also exceptions. And it's also important to build software based on established and well-documented building blocks. And another aspect is that free software is interoperable by principle, and that means that there is nothing that forces the users to pick a one-size-fits-all solution. Because if I open, if I create a document with LibreOffice, then I can also open it with Apache OpenOffice. There's no question about that. And anyone can implement the standard, and I can use any of the softwares that implement that standard to work with the files. If we look at the macroeconomic uh, dynamics, so for instance, if we look at Germany or the European Union, then there are actually many good opportunities with um, open source. And we have yeah, lower costs through cooperation 
It also improves competition in the market. And everyone is uh, on the same level in terms of software availability. And therefore, everyone has the same opportunities. And therefore, free software is a healthy thing for the macroeconomics. At the same time, there is a strengthening of digital competencies because Having the same opportunities in life is not dependent on the income of the parents because everyone can install the software, students, pupils, everyone. And because the source code is open, you can study the source code based on practical examples and learn things about software development. For example, one could learn about what um, text markup is in texts or how texts are rendered. Because this is always the same principle. So, so I have to declare, okay, what is the purpose of this text fragment? Is it a headline? Is it a paragraph? What is it? So, basically, yeah, so it enables learning by doing if people have access to the code and the software. Because people can also learn um, to change the software themselves and see what the effects are. And if you have a good peer group, then you also can get um, code reviews of the changes you made. In any case, this strengthens the digital competencies of the people. And this is something you don't have with proprietary software. And now I'm going into future perspectives. The idea is we should maybe not aim for digital sovereignty, we should not demand it, but maybe digitally, digital solidarity. And I would like to point to the talk by Thomas Fricke, who gave the talk in the sea base, where he talked about that free software is not only about taking, but but it's also an attitude. It's an attitude that assumes, well, if you consider the first freedom, the freedom to study the source code, that, that if you have knowledge, then this gives you freedom. And if you have access to the knowledge and the technology, then you can create more things with it. And something similar you can read in the hacker ethics. And of course, it also says what you should do with the software and not what you should not do with the software. 
digitalen Souveränität ist ein ziemlich individualistischer. So the term of digital solidarity is a very individualistic term. Um, so, uh, sorry, digital sovereignty is a very individualistic term. Um, so if people look at individual states, individual uh, organizations, but yeah, what the creators of free software want is that other people can profit and benefit um, from the software that they write. To quote, um, one does not own a thing in the typical sense or in the right sense if you can still share it without actually losing uh, any benefit yourself. And this ethical attitude has led to the free free software from establishing themselves because this sharing with each other is very fundamental and um, I'm, I'm not a member myself in these organizations uh, but I'm part so but I also observe these tendencies in the CCC that sharing very deliber deliberately sharing is very common in the CCC and elsewhere and it's very reciprocal that people share um, but one learns from each learn one learns from each other and that the over 60 years old lawyer can also learn things from a 16 year old student so there's a level playing field and equal opportunities and this is the approach that we should all demand for the digital realm where the community is taken into account and I think in order to attain that goal free software is needed as much as the many perspectives that uh, members of CCC and um, other organizations that promote free software. And if companies want to be part of this community, it's really easy to do that, basically, if you're not being too arrogant. At least this is my experience. In my hackerspace, I was welcomed very warmly. The community is very interested in the experiences of others and exchanging experiences. I've never left a hackerspace without having learned something. But you have to get into this mindset. And that also means that you may have to forfeit um, your own developments or your own money for the benefit of the community and share with others. And the presentation I mentioned mentioned many different possibilities and opportunities there. And the demand to 
put 10 million euros a year into free software may sound like a lot, but it's, it's only right, it's only just, and it would have so many benefits. So you have to be ready or willing to cooperate, to not be egoistic and are selfish. So, for example, if the open software community develops a software to raise dog taxes, you have to give up the thinking that you don't want your neighbors to profit from this program you just built. This attitude doesn't hold. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, are there, there any? are questions. But first, thank you for your presentation. The audience can still send in questions on Twitter, Mastodon, wherever you want. The first question is, would, wouldn't digital sovereignty also give um, freedom of choice between different open source solutions? Yes. So the problem is vendor logins. Um, if, if I have the choice between two products, but in practice, once I've chosen one of them, and after five years, I realize the other one is actually better. It's very difficult to change to the other product. And in principle, yes, but in, in practice, rather difficult. Then we got a comment. Licenses are still useful to make sure certain limits are being kept to. Uh, relatively simple. Depends on what we mean. What, what, so compliance problems occur only once we publish things. And then I have to take care of Take, take care of making sure that I only use software that where the licenses are compatible, compatible. Only when I publish uh, software, then I have compliance problems between the licenses, and these are actually uh, rather big. And therefore, I suggest that developers should focus on their software, not on the licenses so much. And in our society, where recklessness and respect, uh, a lack of respect is so commonplace, how do you want to ensure that people are ready to be solitary, um, to be solidarious digitally? How we need a conscious, uh, um, we, we, we need to be aware that we cannot continue with our current societal and economic structures the way they are right now. There is a lot of social inequality and this leads to splitting of um, societies. This leads to wars or to other conflicts and, that, and because, because of that even hardcore capitalists have realized that we need to find a solution. I still hope that uh, sen sensibleness, sensibleness will find a way. Reason. Next question. As far as I know, in schools and universities, open source and how to be part of them is not really taught. What do you think about that? 
I'm not a bureaucrat. Yes, there are approaches. Yes, but the problem is it depends on, on the people if they want to do it, if they want to get involved and if they are at the right position to do these things. And, but in our political system, it is unfortunately, yes, yeah, so it's, it's difficult in our political system because things can also change. So there are people who invest a lot of time in promoting free software in schools. And because this teacher was so so, so good, um, they, they were moved to a different school, but then the old school moved back to proprietary software. Follow-up question. How is access to free software regulated? For example, how can students get access to free software licenses or even have the hardware to be able to use that software? Yeah, to hardware, um, free software also runs on older systems. And yeah, free software can have less demand for the hardware. Of course, it depends on what you want to do with the hardware. Um, if you want to learn a programming language, then you can use a Pentium 1 machine. But as I said, we all have very powerful computers today. If I look at this, I'm an old man. I have worked, I have started with an Apple II clone that had a lot less power. Okay, so it looks like there are no other questions. So I would like to conclude the talk. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope that everyone on the stream has been able to enjoy the talk as much as I did.